great. Uh, so, I mean, we had a full week full of events and also with our 2030, the Berlin Fashion Summit conference, the foreign fashion show, and also the foreign showcase event, and many more who was, which were, were happening. Uh, so, Max, what impressions did you have? Well, uh, first of all, I'm very happy that uh, what we have put out there with our summit, and obviously which also kind of swings with uh, the whole foreign activities, um, the theme of active alliances for positive fashion, um, that this really worked out. So I think uh, we managed to bring a lot of really interesting, smart and, and leading voices onto the ground in Berlin and uh, bring them together and um, had a lot of inspiring um, content coming from voices like uh, Luke Havahas, Christine Poulet, or also um, Megan from Market to Land and uh, Nix from Ark uh, Boots as well as so many others like Hasna Kurda from Save Your Wardrobe or Eric Kne from, um, from the CST group. I'm really happy to have finally like the chemical um, industry also on the ground. With us. Yeah. So yeah, a really nice mix of people, yeah, obviously having master students, having like the young talents in there and so many other people combining this um, into like one uh, a live conversation on stage, but also after, st after the stage, during the conference day and during the community day. So like, yeah, very vivid, very diverse, I would say. And yeah, makes me happy to see that we are all back together and that there's so many opportunities to really bring the change, bring the transformation now into implementation. I'm a bit proud uh, on the program we put together and also all the people you guys, please don't translate this kind of thing. But also visited us at the trade fairground at Premium and Seek. And a big thank you also for the Senate of Berlin, who is actually financing. We also had some voices uh, from Michael B, who was uh, opening the conference for us. So that was a really nice start, I think, uh, on the Thursday morning with him on stage and also the support of the trade fairs and Premium Anita. And and Jörg and uh, I mean all the others actually also. Yeah, totally. And I mean, I think, yeah, really good to mention Michael Beal, um, State Secretary of the Senate Department of Economics, Energy and Public Enterprises in Berlin, um, because they do support the Fashion Week in a really new and more holistic way nowadays that I think has a relevant impact. And also, I think we are sharing a vision now. Um, I mean, he opened up with, with this idea of Berlin uh, a place where sustainable concepts can grow and then reach for global impact. And I think that is really um, where, where what we have been working for the last decade already and longer. And it's really nice to see this becoming a more common idea now, I think. Um, and possibly um, we can also talk with our guest here today more about that and see like how he sees it, because obviously we don't have the outside view. We are in our own bubbles also, um, even though we like to break them and hopefully are successful with that. But let's uh, yeah, talk to our dear guest, Kai Pronka, who is an expert also and been kind of um, accompanying the sustainable fashion scenery for so many years now. Um, so yeah, let's look into um, yeah, a feedback from last session. Yeah, it's really nice, Kai, that you're joining us uh, for the session. I mean, we can um, have your voice and also your impressions because, I mean, you are, as Max just mentioned, you're working as a journalist and uh, you are very interested in the topic of sustainable for a long time already. So um, I know you visiting our events for many years and uh, I know that you are also one of the minds um, asking critically behind the scenes and also having a broad view also on what's happening um, in fashion, but also like the sustainability in fashion. So Kai, maybe you also uh, leave some words and you can introduce yourself a bit more and more detailed. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. Thanks for having me. Um, that's right. I'm in that business uh, since over 20 years. I'm visiting fairs and um, uh, I always had the sustainable impact from the beginning when I started into this uh, um, into this segment of uh, sportswear, denim, and um, fashion in general. Like in, I think it was the year 2001. Um, and since then, I'm traveling to fairs and all those conferences and um, talk a lot to retailers because um, I'm... We don't have time till 2015. Business ...to business magazines since that time um, with a short interruption of a magazine called Streetwear. Today, there was a little bit more B2C business, but also uh, during that time, we worked a lot with uh, formats like... Red we don't have any time for 2025, you guys, we'll see. there with, with the sneaker lounges or sneaker... And not by 2030. That, ...that sneaker collectors thing, but also always from the background of a more sustainable 
um, industry at least. Yeah, I would say um, um, the program in Berlin during last week in for the winter edition of Premium Seek and um, your summits as well as the Studio Tour Retail event or all the events that were taken part by the, the Fashion Council Germany or from the Fashion Revolution and all the other activists and so many cited events which took place in the stores, in the offices, um, uh, studios, ateliers, um, and, and, and obviously at least at the clubs or restaurants uh, in the in the. It should be a third option, you guys. From FAZ to I don't know all the names of uh, to name to from from all those yeah let's say like society. Don't have time till twenty thirty. Gala to, um, I, I I really don't follow them. Sorry, but uh, they they all do their lunches and brunches and and their evening events. Um, so at least the city is full of journalists, people. Um, influencers, uh, people from the industry. Oh, it should be a third uh, option, you guys. Don't take part at when you ask yes or no questions, right now, have a third option. Um, however, but at least they join Berlin for this week and um, yeah, they take part in the topic <laughs> of at least. No brands will be alive. So, what did you like most? Which event was the best for you personally? Uh, that's always hard to say because every, every event is different. So you go to the event at least to meet the people you know, um, and then obviously we meet always someone new, no? and you always get new impact, new feedback. You meet, you meet people from other generations on different. So you meet the older generation, you meet the stupid generation, survey. You, you meet your generation. So at least you learn always something new when you go. Uh, out to one of those events. Of course, it was nice to go to the uh, uh, freshly opened um, Telegrafenamt to celebrate 20 years of premium there. Um, and it was not one of those typical it's stupid, parties, really stupid questions, yeah, stupid really, like um, options. Um, Who designed it? Yeah, it was Fire them. like a time war. So you met people there that have been to premium in Berlin 20 years ago, and there were also people that joined um, the, the fashion movement like maybe a couple of seasons ago only, no? so with their, with their projects. And um, it, it was quite, it, it was not this old thing like, yeah, are we all people sitting here since 20 years together and, and, and tap on our shoulders how great we are. It was really young, fresh uh, get together. And also I have the impression when you go to the fair, yeah, of course the people are concerned. <laughs> Think like back in the days, everything was better. And in Cologne, there was more, uh, uh, I don't know, whatever, more, more, more people at least on the fair. But this system has changed dramatically during the last 20 years, as we all know. And, and that's the reason why we don't have that big, uh, the big fairs anymore right now, especially after COVID. So, uh, so, and also the system of retail change. This is the same like the system of, of communication change. So, so we can uh, record a podcast here today uh, over the iPhone. And also people um, do their shopping over the iPhone, but at least not everybody just wants to shop over the iPhone, even if it's possible. So they want to have an experience. So, and um, maybe they they shop things like socks or their underwear, which they exactly know their size and the brand and the colors they want to wear. But if they want to have something that thrills them or that 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 they haven't discovered before. Uh, then they go out and, and look for for an experience in retail. Yeah? So that's the difference. And do you think like with with I mean yeah I mean there's there's I think the one thing that really Berlin Fashion Week has shown this time is it's back to at least being very lively, very diverse, and and one already has kind of way more events than one can actually attend to. So in, in that way, it's it's kind of back in a really strong and full way. But at the same time, I would say, I mean, the whole industry is, is in a moment of reality check still, and there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, did, did you have one format or, or one kind of uh, moment where you thought, oh, here I can feel a moment of, of the future already? Like, which surprised you in that sense maybe the most, which is kind of was um, more of a hint how the future of fashion and especially maybe in Berlin can look like. Did you have a moment like that? Yeah, I, I had that moment in during the conversation. So the the moment I the, the moment was already there before COVID. Now I remember a show that was uh, um, uh, during the the Mercedes Machines Dance Fashion Week in Kraftwerk um, when when it was the opening shows that were organized by South African designers. So um, the, the the people always started to compare Berlin with Paris or Milan or New York 100%. or London where the fashion weeks have been established like 
20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. And Berlin is at least with the fashion weeks on the map since I think 2005, six, seven, somewhere. Yeah? So, and then it was interrupted. It changed the organizers and whatever. And now we had a change um, at least a little bit again after Mercedes um, did not take part for this season. So it is the same company that produced the event and in Kankaraden it was definitely a very, very nice location and was a unique location which you not see everywhere else you know, in, in the world when it's uh, when it's a fashion week and the same with the studio to retail events. I don't know a city that has that compromise um, program of retail events during a fashion week in uh, like it was in Berlin. You know? So the, there's really kind of a union of those retailers and they they um, they, they pull together on one rope and uh, then just uh, being competitors. So and Right. Um, this is a the feeling, which uh, which comes up and also re rep reflects or represents the feeling of Berlin a little bit. Um, the people help each other. The people work together. The people are interested in networking together. Of course, nowadays we have all the politicians on the side. <laughs> because after twenty years, which took uh, twenty years ago, they were also on the side because they were interested to get all this, those businesses here um, uh, when when Berlin was still a white blank of paper. And um, but now they are really supportive, and they really understand that they have to, to do something for this industry, like it is done in Italy for 50 years already, or like it is done in London. If you follow the Fashion Council of London, I think they have 550,000 followers on Instagram. If you follow the German Fashion Council, I think they are somewhere uh, around 50,000. So you can see there is a difference in in those uh, kind of. Um, um, yeah, in kind of the systems as well. So, but here in in Berlin, um, you can discover always something new. It's um, it's the it's the little brands that make totally a difference. When when you when you saw the shows and you even can follow them online on Instagram, or um, so you don't have even to go there. If you live in the countryside in Germany, even you can take part at Berlin Fashion Week at its fullest. And um, yeah, also see the Ukrainian designers that, that show here since a couple of seasons. It's like really, and, or as you said, like from the point of diversity or um, everybody in fashion is talking about, yeah, they're missing the avant-garde in Berlin is the avant-garde. So it is like all this club culture, this diversity, the people that live in the different, different districts, they come and present themselves on those shows. You know? So we have very experimental, uh, venues from from Atelier Garden Studios or um, um, yeah the Kant Garage obviously or yeah there were so many different places to visit and to see that yeah it's not boring here no definitely and I mean do you think I mean the, now I, I'm seeing two parts which are combining and I mean if that works out I think then we are in a really good track with the Fashion Week you mentioned on the one hand there's kind of studio to retail and a lot of active activities uh, with retail stores in, in, in Berlin and I think there's also more creative uh, ones obviously involved that showcase how maybe concept stores of the future look like and I mean in Germany in general we are a retail and wholesale based industry very strongly at the same time you, you, you mentioned like okay there's been really a lot of shows from young talents and this avant-garde partly coming from club culture background but also from just this very diverse cultural mix that we have in Berlin also a lot of uh, uh, political refugees, a lot of kind of political activism in the city that is also picked up from a lot of the fashion designers in many different ways. Do you think this we are getting the, a combination of these two really strong elements, like this retail strength that Germany has in general, and that is kind of obviously reflected in a lot of fashion stores also in Berlin? And the, on the other hand, all these really young talents that are really sustainability, but also in many ways culturally avant-garde orientated. Yeah, I must say the problem is that not that many retailers go to the shows or go to those events. I don't events. have to repeat so myself, you the, guys. The people that so visit those articles. events or the shows, um, they are mainly journalists, uh, influencers, or people from the, yeah, from the scene at least. No? So it's it's very rarely that I met retailers there. Um, it's rather the PR people that go there or from the PR agencies and do it, it's a little bit more kind of a networking and of course it's very press driven so because the press at least has the power to show all those designers on their on their different platforms and uh, when, when the influencers wear their thing um, I think most of those designers that show their 
or not most of them, but some of them um, are only to sell, able to sell online due to their own channels or um, yeah, in very small specialized concept stores. So that is what we see on the one hand. Of course, we see also big shows from um, established designers, if it is like Kilian Kerner or, um, um, uh, or others that, um, that are already <coughs> selling in a commercial way also in department stores. So, um, but also they are, yeah, I, I don't think that guys that that like you really their, making me feel like I'm repeating more, myself uh, like press and media related, uh, related event and um, so that, that is a little bit but it has ever been like this in Berlin so it was never that that all the retailers come up to the from the trade shows or from all the side events in the showrooms um, and go and visit the shows front row so that is not and it's also not what I'm expected. No? It probably doesn't happen in other cities as well. I mean, uh, I think like a show format is uh, especially there to show the collection to press and also to maybe some of the um, buyers. But I mean, in the end, uh, the sales of the collections are being done in showrooms usually or like on trade fairs. And this is, I think, it's a bit interesting uh, to have a look at because uh, we, we just talked about that um, the retail has to change or will change or already has changed a lot. And uh, people are coming in um, in retail stores or like concept stores to have an experience. But still, I mean, the ways um, how clothes or like how fashion is sold is very classical. I mean, the structures are still there or like are, are, are still in the mind. So maybe it uh, should be like that, that more retailers should attend shows to get more inspiration because this is something they need to the offer to their clients as well. Because I, you I and did you design it? If you're talking you about did. retail experiences, it's, it's about inspiration, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. At least, and it's a look and feel and a people's book. So it's, uh, you always can scroll to your feed on Instagram and say, like, ah, oh, this is nice, and I would like to have that. But at least to make the decision, if you really buy it, first of all, you need to touch it. You know? So if, if, it, if the look and feel is nice, if it is your fit, if it is your silhouette, if also the people that are... Uh, dealing with it, are they like-minded people like you? And this is what you want to have uh, for the future in your wardrobe. So, and this is also how at least that business works in total. It is a people's business and it's like very look and feel driven. That is the reason why it worked uh, like it worked back in the days. Of course, there's a young generation and there's a big uh, topic about the metaverse things and about uh, digital fashion and about everything, but it's still not happening in a, in a, in a big scale. So we had all those um, digital fashion things for scale. charity, and we have that uh, as a kind of an entertainment for for social media and everything. Right. But at least people need to wear clothes uh, when they leave the house, or even if they stay inside the house, they want to wear uh, comfortable clothes, or if they go for the for the uh, for the gym or whatever. So they they wear shoes, clothes, and uh, accessories when they when they are on the street, and this is what they buy at least somewhere, and. We see so much different formats. Like you have those uh, vintage secondhand roadshows that go from one place uh, to the other um, to 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 open up for new target groups. You know, when we were young and then we traveled to Amsterdam, to London, or to Paris to buy our denim jackets or our leather jackets on the flea markets there. So um, Berlin is today one of probably the biggest vintage secondhand market driven. <coughs> Uh, um, areas in Europe because when I go to the flea market I see young people from everywhere in the world uh, searching for the latest 90s vintage pieces oversized blazers or uh, leather coats that look like in the matrix or uh, um, I um, sunglasses I wear from from that uh, decade we have specialized retailers that sell those on the flea market we have I don't know how many secondhand stores in Berlin but it's really 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 a lot and um, they are so good curated. Um, just, just a new one opened up next to the Mazuka store on Castanien Allee. I saw the window and I thought, like, I'm, it's like everything comes from Paris there. So, and um, good vibes. Pa like, you know, Paris is no longer relevant. They are growing in Berlin and they are uh, a transformed for Berlin also to other cities so that people come here and get their inspiration. Say, like, oh, I start this also in wherever, from Bozen to maybe Heidelberg or um, so at least there's everywhere a little space for a good concept which you got inspired by when you went for a trip to Berlin.
I mean, we, we did like a showcase um, where we include like a metaverse as well. And I think, um, I mean, it is a nice playground uh, for fashion brands, but, uh, and still it was also a very nice experience for all visitors coming in and uh, having like for the first time in their life, like VR glasses and then be able to walk through a gallery like on spatial. And we, we were setting this up. I mean, this was, uh, I think, from from like the like an experience uh, point of view, it was a nice experience. But I also agree that um, like fashion and metaverse is probably getting big as soon as we're having like uh, very easy accessible apps uh, for our Zoom calls where we can dress uh, like digitally dress up or like have uh, our that. like digital makeup on, um, so that you have really like concrete. <laughs> Yeah, ways Nobody of like actually that. wearing uh, clothes uh, in like a digital area because I mean, of course, now I'm sitting here with my normal clothes and I have my camera on. Even if you don't see it, if you listen to our podcast, but uh, if we were sitting in a Zoom call, I could just dress up for another one. Uh, and if I had like the um, fitting uh, digital app, so I think this is uh, probably also or like there is a potential I see with digital fashion at least. Yeah, I think the digital fashion potential is like. It's like endless, or, or to, I must say, but um, I rather I'm rather interested in those little formats that are company uh, that are that are family driven, or, or right. that, are, that, are, that a company is run by 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 one women show like the April Trust store here in Berlin, and um, or the Kleiderei concept that try to um, to to solve the, the problem of um, uh, of the overconsumption overproduction where they where they offer all the second hand clothes for affordable prices um, in that rental system where you just can go and you exchange your clothes and um, the, the clothes is used and used and used afterwards again instead of sending it to uh, um, yeah a, a bin or um, a landfill somewhere in the world and and waste it she knows so um, of course digital fashion is the um, part of the future but i'm more interested in those yeah in those simple at, at least it is quite simple what they did with Kleiderei, but at least um, nobody did it before so they invented it 10 years ago and now they are uh, i think they opened with a berlin store the fifth store in germany where people can just where they have a simple solution for a problem that we all have in, that, uh, in mankind and it, it, it's really, it, it impressed me how simple it is and how they earn the money with it, at least. I mean, you mean rental at the end, I think. I mean, it's the baseline that, that Kleiderei does um, and, and yeah, has done for many, many years. Um, but I mean, maybe just to put things together, I mean, I think there's not one solution. I guess we can all agree on that for sustainability, but like plenty of solutions that need to work together and we kind of need new forms of ecosystems that, that kind of bring these solutions together and make them uh, applicable for, for our future. So I guess, yeah, rental is part of it, recycling, uh, better kind of resale, um, et cetera, sharing between peer groups. It's, there's so many aspects that come uh, more and more alive, often also because of um, better d digital technology. I think also Kleiderei would not work if they didn't have uh, quite a good kind of system behind um, on dealing with the stock and then how to exchange the clothes with uh, little kind of um, resource as possible in terms of human resource. Um, but yeah, I guess like we're still in an experimental phase with everything around metaverse, etc. But it is obvious already it is becoming part of the overall game and will be a relevant part of the game changing. Um, but I hope you, you see, and people will see it. Yeah, but what is kind of the most you know. concrete steps at the moment that one can see and feel maybe in Berlin? Um, I mean, we've been talking about Berlin Fashion Week and slowly now also about like Berlin as, a, as an ecosystem, as a home um, for many different sustainability initiatives, um, I would say. Uh, can you see like where where things are heading? What what of these many concepts is working the best already? I think Kleiderei is one of these examples now with their own shop in Berlin. Is there some of your favorite solutions that are alive in Berlin already and that kind of promise a, a positive future for fashion? Yeah, at least that the, all those kind of uh, uh, concepts get a kind of a proof of their concept. Right? So if I look at uh, Natasha van Hirschhausen with this waste this collection and she opened the store in um, uh, on Friedrichstraße. So at least all.
2020-30 podcast. In today's episode, we are talking about what lies ahead. And today's session is all about change makers of the fashion industry. We have invited four wonderful people on the panel talking about what lies ahead by Aesthetica. What is Aesthetica, Max? Well, Aesthetica, I mean, it's been around for a long time and it reappeared now. It is basically a brand and a vision, I guess, from um, Orsa de Castro, who's a dear friend of us. You know her, I know her for many years. Um, she's the co-founder of Fashion Revolution, besides many other things. Um, she's also one of these perhaps cycling pioneers, really. She's been writing books. So her vision, well, actually not just hers, I think also her lovely husband, uh, Filippo de Ricci, plays a really important part in Aesthetica too. And um, when it used to be a trade show or showroom uh, during London Fashion Week for many years, where people also like Christopher Rayburn um, exhibited and were pushed forward into new levels in the fashion industry. So really a pioneering platform very early in the game that gave space and, and highlighted sustainability and the importance of, of change in the industry. And nowadays, I think, it's again a platform, not um, in this kind of old school physical sense, but more as a creator of agency for change in the fashion industry. And well, Osler always um, highlights how important kindness is. And I think this is something that we're also trying to drive, besides obviously innovation, inclusivity, and a positive vision. She's also a very kind person <coughs> herself. <laughs> I really like her. And we, we are kind of connected. You already mentioned that we know each other for many years already. Um, being some of those, some pioneers starting with a platform really early before sustainable fashion was actually like present uh, during any uh, fashion weeks um, and so on. So it's really nice that we had this cooperation during the last Berlin Fashion Week, uh, during the uh, 2020-30, the Berlin Fashion Summit in uh, September. Beside um, Ursula, we have uh, three other wonderful guests on our panel, which is Matthew Needham, uh, who is the creative director of the fashion exhibition. Um, and also Vade Castro, who was curating the exhibition. And Miriam Ladiri is also talking about her perspective uh, coming from the Council of Modest Fashion. The panel is moderated by Fatima Noya from the Glamour Germany. And uh, what they're actually talking about is their personal stories and uh, turning points in their experiences, what they actually made them think differently and started their own initiatives and try to change fashion in their way. Yeah, there will be so many really interesting change makers that provide their point of view now. But I would also consider ourselves as change makers, actually. I mean, we've been working for more than 10 years uh, really intensively on bringing sustainability into the fashion industry. Um, so what is your drive? What was your journey behind it, actually? And um, what is still driving you? Yeah, um, my journey is quite a long one because, I mean, all my working life, I'm actually uh, working with sustainability and fashion. And uh, one of my turning points was actually media coverage of the really bad circumstances people are working in the fashion industry. And I just covered these uh, at the beginning of 2000s uh, while I was studying. I was really thinking like, this is an industry I love because I'm a fashion designer and I love this aesthetics. I don't want to support uh, these mechanisms uh, in the industry. I want to be part of this this one. And um, this is why I was looking uh, for other companies working in a different way, working with other values behind them, and uh, discovering that there was uh, hardly no really sustainable, appealing, nicely uh, appealing fashion um, out there. And this, is, this was a reason why I was starting my own brand called Magdalena Chateau. Since now, after more than 15 years uh, working, I see that the industry has made progress, but not, not <coughs> enough. I mean, it's simply not enough. All efforts are not, uh, we are not going to reach the goals we are setting us. Um, we are not going to stop uh, or rever even reverse global warming. It's just not happening. So I kind of lost my optimism I mm -hmm. in the beginning of my working life. Uh, we I'm all did, you fashion people. <laughs> um, because I still hope for uh, the possibility to, to change. And this is also what keeps me uh, working and keeps me uh, like standing up, getting out of bed every day and really putting a lot of energy um, of my life in my working life. Because I really want to change something. And um, 
with creating platforms where people can collaborate. Um, I think we are doing something which is actually supporting this. Uh, this is the worst review, the, you know, survey I've ever done. Yeah, I totally agree. And obviously, I mean, this was also one of the triggers for me to realize that collaboration is, is actually such an important key. And uh, at the beginning, I always also have the feeling like, okay, there's things happening, but somehow it's all not connected and uh, it's not happening quickly enough. And I think, yeah, that was also the reason why we joined forces um, over so many years now already and we are continuing to do so. And I hope that um, as Aesthetica is providing more and more support as a platform, obviously we also with our platforms like 202030, the World Fashion Summit, can support to further development of sustainability here. And this is why we are happy to have our new guest, Ursula de Castro, Matthew Needham, Maryam Nadiri, and the moderator, Fatima Nuria. Hi, nice to meet you. And I'm happy you're here after a long day of talks and maybe shows and things. Um, we are very happy to be here and talk with you guys about the future. But before we get into it, I want to introduce myself a little bit more. My name is Fatima, <laughs> as Stella said, thank you. And um, I'm fashion sustainability editor for Glamour Germany. So I write about fashion as well as sustainability because I think um, both can be very beautifully together. And I'm today here with Matthew. Ursula and Miriam, and um, we are part of the concept or the ethical fashion showcase, Aesthetica. You may or may not have seen it outside. This is the thing where the clothes hang. <laughs> and if you stay here with us, you can have a little tour around because Matthew actually created Aesthetica. So we can learn a little bit more from him. It's a showcase with 10 designers from Berlin and the Ukrainian who really try to do something with sustainable fashion. So quite exciting. And yeah, let's go into it. I guess, can you guys start? Um, I want to start with a quick question. Um, I want to have answered by you because I think fashion and especially sustainable fashion is always about storytelling. We're here to tell stories of our clothes because it's nice to have them, it's nice to see them, but it's always the bigger pictures behind because you don't dress yourself just, maybe also just for fun, but there's always some underlying issue. And I think that's the most thing or the thing that makes fashion so beautiful. So I want to ask you first, like maybe you can start and answer my question. What is your message and why are you here? And then I will introduce you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, well, I'm here because I was invited, just to think. <laughs> um, well, I would say my message is, um, like, I have to go back why, why I started uh, doing fashion. It was back in um, the 90s, I was 12 years old, and I realized that the fashion industry gave me nothing that goes in line with my identity, which was I was still searching for. Like um, a Muslim girl growing up in the West, I didn't know where I belong, I was looking for that. So, And I think um, I found my way through that something that was not existing, and later <coughs> it was called this fashion. Um, but why I'm here today is to, yeah, like tell everybody you can believe in yourself and you can still make it and we are all um, part of this fashion world and it's changing and it's going, I hope, in the right direction. So, so yeah. let me say quick words to you. This okay. is Mariam Labdiri. <laughs> she is a German-Algerian fashion designer um, from her own label, which is 